Vietnam War has entered its fourth year for American soldiers. As the Battle of Hamburger Hill rages, anti-war sentiment in the States grows considerably. The American public is shocked by gruesome images of war, of killed and wounded young Americans fighting far from their homes. The Battle of Hamburger Hill, which claimed the lives of 72 American soldiers over a strategically irrelevant hill, laid bare the horrors of jungle warfare. It changed the general American perception of the war and influenced military and political circles. And while the entire America is appalled by the scenes from the Battle of Hamburger Hill, unknown to them, at that very moment, just a hundred miles south, American GIs are going through another hell, the Battle of Tam Kai. The course of the battle is kept secret to avoid further public outrage. The struggle of the men who for four entire weeks endured one of the toughest battles of the Vietnam War remained unknown, not just then, but for decades to come. This is their story. The story of the Battle of Tam Kai began on May 12th, when the units of the North Vietnamese Army attacked Quan Tin Province, only 40 miles south of Da Nang. In days preceding the offensive, the North Vietnamese had managed to smuggle in two regiments of their 2nd Division into the area. The U.S. Army 23rd Infantry Division, better known as the Americal Division, responsible for the province's defense, was caught by total surprise and was unable to withhold the persistent and frantic attacks of the battle-hardened NVA soldiers. The NVA concentrated their attacks on crucial strategic points in the area that served as both fire support bases and landing zones. The most violent combat occurred at LZ Professional, held by the 1st Battalion of the Americal Division's 46th Infantry Regiment. Already at the start of the offensive, it became evident that the Americal Division alone could not defend the area. In just two days, the NVAs had secured almost 80% of the province and threatened its administrative and trading center, the town of Tam Kai. Therefore, on May 14th, the commander of the Americal Division called for a tactical emergency. Military Assistance Command Vietnam MACV, recognized the importance of Quan Tin Province, was quick to react. They issued an order to transport two battalions of the 101st Airborne Division to the province to help relieve the pressure on the Americal Division. The units engaged for the mission, codenamed Operation Lamar Plain, were the 1st Battalion of the 501st and the 1st Battalion of the 502nd Infantry Regiments. By May 1969, the 101st Airborne Division had established itself as a highly effective fighting force in Vietnam, having proven its mettle in some of the war's most significant operations. This reputation was a key reason for their selection for this operation. Additionally, the 1st Battalion of the Americal Division's 46th Infantry Regiment was attached to the task force. On May 15th, the men of the 101st aboard the large twin rotor CH-47 Chinooks landed at Quan Tin Province. Owing to the urgency of the situation, they arrived equipped only with their ammunition and basic supplies, with the remainder of their equipment scheduled to arrive later via trucks and jeeps. By the following day, the paratroopers were already engaged in action. The 1st Battalion of the 501st was airlifted to the area around the LZ Professional. Three companies in the reconnaissance platoon were dropped four miles north of the firebase. The whole thing happened so quickly that officers had no time to disclose the entire plan to their men. Once they set their feet on the ground, the units spread out and moved toward LZ Professional. This was what they called Reconnaissance in Force RIF mission, patrolling through the jungle looking for enemy presence and engaging them at first sight. Over the following days, the battalion conducted its operations under extreme weather conditions, with the terrain offering little respite from the heat. The 101st had arrived from Asha Valley, distinctive for high mountains and moderate temperatures, so they still had to accommodate the new climate. However, reconnaissance operations were hindered not only by the tough environment, but also by the uncertainty of enemy positions and strength. On their path, men of the 101st discovered a great number of enemy huts, spider holes, bunkers, and trenches, but had only sporadic light contacts with enemy soldiers. The formidable infrastructure was clear evidence of a large formation's presence yet these were nowhere to be found. Nevertheless, the GIs knew not to let their guard down. The enemy was there, and it was just a matter of time before they would clash with them. Intelligence reports indicated a potential for increased enemy engagements, leading to the assignment of the 1st Battalion 
of the 501st for a reconnaissance in force mission near Hill 187. Companies Bravo, Charlie, and Delta were sent to the area along with Recon Platoon. It didn't take long for them to encounter the enemy. Indeed, the intelligence was accurate. As events of the day would reveal, Hill 187 was swarming with NBA forces. The first units to engage the enemy were the Recon Platoon and Bravo Company. The NVAs engaged them with fire from AK-47 assault rifles and a heavy 12.7mm DK machine gun. Despite facing only seven NVA soldiers, the Americans were pinned down by devastating fire from the heavy machine gun, coupled with indirect mortar fire. For half an hour, they couldn't raise their heads. Compounding the issue, the terrain was mostly open and covered with scattered, dried-up rice paddies, trees, and bushes, providing little space for cover. It was only when Charlie and Delta companies had arrived that the enemy withdrew from their positions. Unfortunately, this initial clash was only a hint of what was left to come. Now that the enemy's location was identified, the battalion received an order to continue the engagement. However, executing this order proved to be far easier said than done. A fierce battle ensued, advancing in several columns up the hill. American soldiers were attacking the well-entrenched enemy while constantly suffering fire from assault rifles, machine guns, mortars, and rocket launchers. Their sole advantage was using the stone walls built to transform steep hill slopes into arable land as cover. For each bunker and trench, GIs had to maneuver and use suppressive fire in combination with grenade attacks. However, each time they would clear out the enemy bunker, it seemed as if more enemy soldiers would arrive to replace their fallen comrades. The thing was, the bunkers were connected with an entire system of underground tunnels, which the North Vietnamese superbly exploited for reinforcing pinned down positions and recovering their dead and wounded. In addition to being connected to bunkers, tunnels were also linked to several parallel lines of spider holes. Perfectly camouflaged, these holes were practically invisible to American soldiers. As the soldiers moved beyond a foxhole, NVA troops would suddenly emerge from the ground, launching surprise attacks from behind. Exhausted by several days of patrolling in a harsh climate, low on water and ammunition, and attacked by the enemy from all directions, the men of the 101st were suffering severe casualties. Yet they were persistent to continue fighting and pushing the enemy up the hill. The struggle and heroism of the Screaming Eagles were best portrayed by the actions of Sergeant Santiago Aravia, a radio telephone operator in Charlie Company. Upon breaching an insurgent perimeter, Aravia received orders from his platoon leader to administer first aid to several casualties while the rest of the platoon advanced. Despite facing intense hostile fire from four bunkers to his left, Aravia decided to return the fire rather than seek cover with his comrades. With enemy bullets raining down on him, he fearlessly traversed the battleground, crawling from one wounded soldier to another to collect ammunition. Armed with two M16 rifles, a bunch of magazines, and several hand grenades, he boldly charged toward the enemy positions, utilizing the suppressive fire from his rifles. Undeterred by the ferocious enemy fire, he pressed forward until he reached his first bunker. Ignoring the barrage of bullets, he unpinned a hand grenade and advanced unleashing suppressive fire before dropping the grenade into the bunker. Without a moment's hesitation, he replicated his tactics, successfully eliminating the next two enemy positions. With his supply of hand grenades depleted after destroying the third bunker, Aravia persisted in the face of relentless fire from the fourth bunker. Demonstrating exceptional courage, he surged forward behind the protective cover of his M16 rifles. Upon reaching the brink of the bunker, he neutralized the enemy soldiers from point-blank range. Sergeant Aravia's remarkable courage not only preserved the lives of his injured comrades under his protection, but also alleviated the pressure on the endangered command post of Charlie Company. For gallantry showed in combat, Aravia received the Medal of Honor in 2014, 45 years after the battle. The battle at Hill 187 persisted until nightfall. It was only under the veil of darkness with helicopters flying in without navigation lights that it was possible to land on the hill to evacuate the wounded and resupply the unit with ammunition and provisions. Although the descent of night marked a pause in the combat, the struggle for Hill 187 was far from concluded. A company-sized NBA formation still occupied a substantial bunker complex at the hill summit. However, the following day, the MACV adopted a new approach. Three large 250-pound bomb airstrikes hit the bunker complex and forced the NVAs to leave it. 
The May 21st fighting was the most severe of the entire battle, resulting in 12 men killed and 49 wounded for the 1st Battalion of the 501st. During the next three days, the 101st Airborne Division faced intense combat near across the entire province, engaging in reconnaissance and skirmishes against the North Vietnamese Army and Viet Cong. Despite encountering sniper fire and sporadic engagements, the period that followed remained relatively quiet, marked by reconnaissance operations and precautions against potential threats. The relief finally came on May 30th, when the National Liberation Front, the political wing of the Viet Cong, announced a 48-hour ceasefire in honor of Buddha's birthday. The day passed without enemy contact or casualties, allowing Bravo Company and Recon Platoon to be relocated for a brief period. On June 2nd, the hostilities resumed. Three companies and the recon platoon that took the brunt of the battle at Hill 187 moved to a new location, Hill 376. There, an overwhelming enemy force pinned down an 18-man arrow rifle platoon of the 2nd Squadron, 17th Cavalry Regiment. For the next seven days, the men of the 101st survived the same scenario as on Hill 187. They moved up and down the slopes from one bunker to another, facing murderous fire from enemy machine guns, mortars, and grenades. As described by one of the 101st officers, the place was a hornet's nest. The crucial day of the engagement on Hill 376 occurred on June 9th. The day began with Alpha Company being jolted awake by enemy mortar fire, luckily causing no casualties due to the enemy's imprecise aim. The situation escalated as Delta Company faced an imminent larger scale enemy assault hinted at by earlier reconnaissance. Hardly would have the company survived the massive assaults of the enemies if it wasn't for the aerial cavalry, which provided critical firepower that helped repel the enemy's advance. Despite the small victory achieved, the tension didn't subside. As the day saw continuous exchanges of fire, including a tragic incident of friendly fire that resulted in further casualties within Bravo Company, throughout the day the soldiers faced a series of intense engagements, with each unit playing a role in the coordinated defense and counter-assault efforts. In the end, the artillery support proved decisive, helping to disrupt the enemy's plans to move large forces to attack Delta Company positions. The report of June 10th noted that the enemy activity slackened around 376 as the 1-501st continued to search the battlefield. It was only at the end of the day that the enemy reappeared, sending salvos of mortar fire on American positions. The threat was ultimately eliminated by engaging an AC-130 spooky gunship armed with two M61 20mm Vulcan cannons. On June 12th, units of the 1st Battalion, 501st, were relieved from Hill 376. Yet another grueling episode of their combat path was over. They had suffered 23 killed, 34 wounded, and one missing in action. Following a month of relentless conflict, where no side secured a clear upper hand, Operation Lamar plane hit a critical juncture. The strategy shifted from reconnaissance and force missions to the pursuit of an enemy that skillfully dodged engagement while retreating to its strongholds deep within the hinterlands. While some of these were targeted for ground attacks, other suspected sites were bombarded by B-52 strikes. By late July and August, the operation was largely confined to the southern sectors of the combat zone. The enemy forces fragmented into smaller factions, often less than 10 combatants each, predominantly around the vicinity of fire support base Boxer. During the patrols, American soldiers uncovered a network of elaborate bunkers and tunnels alongside makeshift hospitals, classrooms, and various enemy facilities. On the afternoon of August 11th, the engagement of the 101st Airborne Division in the province of Kwantin finally came to an end. A C-130 from the Air Force embarked from Tam Kai, ferrying a contingent of soldiers from the 1-501st Infantry. They touched down at Camp Evans and subsequently journeyed to LZ Sally by truck. Over the ensuing three days, a series of transport planes, convoys, and helicopter flights progressively returned the rest of the division to the base. Operation Lamar Plane officially concluded at 8 a.m. on August 14, 1969. Throughout the mission, 126 men were killed and another 404 wounded, a toll substantially higher than that at Hamburger Hill. Yet the world remained largely unaware of this sacrifice. Moreover, the families of those who perished on Hill 187 and Hill 376 were led to believe their loved ones had fallen at Hamburger Hill instead. Nevertheless, the veterans of the 101st Airborne Division have never forgotten that grueling month. It was a time during which they endured the agony of loss and witnessed the death of their comrades.
Despite the horrors, the men bravely faced a determined enemy and reflected the highest traditions of the 101st Airborne Division. Thank you for watching this episode. If you liked it, give us a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell icon to be notified of our next video. Stay tuned.